Now that we've computed the aggregate price uh, under uh, bargaining, um, what we can do is look at the comparative statics of the model if uh, prices are, are bargained. And what we'll see is that the comparative statics are completely different from those that we saw with a fixed price. And then you know, down the line, we're going to look at what, when, at what happens when we have a rigid price, which is something that moves in the direction of the bargain price, but not just quite as much. When we'll see that qualitatively, actually, in that case, although the price is in between fixed and bargain price, all the qualitative properties are the same as um, those under the fixed price. So um, the comparative statics under the bargain price are actually just a knife edge um, solution. They are very special. Um, nevertheless, they are a good uh, benchmark, so it's useful to see what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> so what we saw is that um, under bargain price, two things that are um, very special. So one is that we computed what um, the price was uh, under bargain price. So uh, <clears throat> under the bargain price, prices are given by a price norm Pn, and that price norm actually here doesn't depend on uh, you know, on, in a sense, it doesn't depend on uh, tightness. That price norm is just a function of the parameters. Of the model. So price norm is that the price is equal to key epsilon times mu over k times 1 minus beta uh, epsilon minus 1. So all of this is from the work we've done uh, computing uh, bargain prices. And then we have f of 2 minus 1 of beta over 1 minus beta. And uh, so that's a key thing that we have under bargain price. Another key thing is that actually our tightness, uh, and that's imposed um, by the bargaining uh, process, our tightness is equal to tau minus 1 beta over 1 minus beta. All right? Um, so these are the key property under bargain price. So now what are the comparative statics? Um, so we can start with uh, an aggregate demand shock. And we can look exactly at what we had seen before. So, for instance, say a positive aggregate demand shock, so increase in key, uh, the parameter from the utility function that says how many services people want to consume, or an increase in mu, the endowment of wealth. <coughs> so, and so, what do we have here? Uh, well, so the key thing is that if you have an increase in key or an increase in mu, what we had seen is that uh, if prices were fixed, uh, this would lead to uh, an increase in tightness, right? Uh, a positive demand, demand shock. Here, what happens? Uh, well, the tightness is given here uh, by this expression. And what we can see is that um, this demand parameter key and mu, they do not enter the expression for tightness. So what we know is that actually the tightness is not going to change when you have an aggregate demand shock. So tightness x remains the same. How is that possible? Don't we have a shift in aggregate in the aggregate demand curve? Well, no, actually we don't because the price, the bargain price, is going to increase to absorb that increase in uh, aggregate demand, such that the aggregate demand curve remains the same position and tightness remains the same. And you can see it here. Uh, you can see that the price actually depends on, on key, depends on mu. And so when you have an increase in key, an increase in mu, uh, the price P uh, increases. <clears throat> and in fact, that increase is going to be sufficient uh, to absorb uh, the shock. So it's going to absorb the uh, AD shock, so quantities do not change. What I mean with quantities is the quantities in the model, so output, consumption, and so on. These are all determined by tightness. Since tightness is the same, the quantities will remain the same. And so that's really the key uh, property here. Uh, the key result is that tightness remains the same because we, uh, the price P is going to go up. Um, and so, because tightness is the same, uh, we know that output <coughs> Y, consumption C, you know, the rate, um, the probability to sell, 
f the rate of idle, which is f of x, the rate of idle, idleness, 1 minus f of x, the matching wedge, tau of x, um, all of these quantities, they remain the same. And that's because tightness is the same. So that's, uh, you know, so aggregate demand shock, nothing is very interesting under bargain price. They are completely absorbed by the price change and in the, in, you wouldn't see any change in quantities. Uh, what about an AS shock, aggregate supply shock? So for instance, as we had done before, what happens if say you have an increase in K, the capacity in the economy? And again, we see that K doesn't show up in our, uh, in our expression for tightness that we have here. Uh, so tightness remains once more the same. So that's quite interesting. Aggregate supply shocks, they do not, uh, they do not affect tightness either under uh, bargaining. What is the reason? Once more, it's because you have a response of the price. And here, you have an increase in aggregate supply. So if you want tightness to remain the same, you need demand to fall. So you need the price to fall. Uh, and that's what happens here. Uh, the price P decreases. So basically, you know, it's basically going to absorb the AS shock. So, uh, you know, tightness remains the same. Um, however, here, because capacity has changed, um, some quantities are going to change. Uh, so we have to separate. So on the one hand, you know, the uh, the selling probability, the rate of idleness, the buying probability, the matching wage, which depend only on tightness, these guys are all going to remain the same. That's because tightness hasn't changed. However, um, output is going to change. So output, you remember, it's f of x times k. Now it's true that x here is the same, but k has increased. And so as a result, uh, so output is going to increase here. So that's different from what we have under an aggregate demand shock. Under an aggregate demand shock is completely neutral. Uh, so here we can see we can see that AD is neutral. Aggregate demand is neutral. Fluctuation and aggregate demand have no effects on anything. Aggregate supply is different because they affect the capacity in the economy. If you have more capacity, you're going to in, uh, increase output. Same thing with consumption. Consumption is output divided by one plus tau x. Now tau x remains the same, but y goes up. So consumption also increases. So in aggregate supply shocks, although tightness does not change and because the scale of the economy changes, we have more services, um, output and consumptions are going to uh, are going to change. However, you know, uh, in both cases, because tightness doesn't change, the rate of idleness doesn't change. So in, if we were in a world in which our prices were bargained, the rate of idleness would never change. Um, so the amount of slack in the economy would never change. So that's not consistent with what we see in the real world, of course, because the amount of slack varies a lot. Um, but that's, that's what you would see um, if prices were bargained. Um, so so th these, are the, these are the comparative statics. Um, so the last thing we can do would be uh, what happens if you have a change in bargaining power, which is something very specific to the uh, bargaining setup, but nevertheless, that's something that we can study. <clears throat> so let's say we have a, a bargaining shock. So let's imagine, for instance, that uh, that we have an increase in beta, which is the bargaining power of buyers. So let's say suddenly buyers have more bargaining power. Uh, 
what would happen in this world. Well, actually, let's do the other way around uh, because I think that you know there has been a lot of discussion of an increase in markups these days with firms having more uh, actually market power. So this in this model you can capture it. This idea that maybe firms now have more bargaining power, markups are higher. This would be the equivalent of a decrease in beta, the bargaining power of buyers. Uh, that is, we are looking at an increase. In the bargaining power of sellers, uh, which is something that you know has been, uh, which is kind of in the same spirit as an increase in markups, which has been documented in recent uh, years. So, what would happen if we have a decrease in beta? Well, we can go up. So you can see in beta, if beta falls, beta over one minus beta fall. Uh, now tau minus one, uh, tau minus one, <coughs> it's uh, an increasing function, uh, and so as a result, beta one over minus beta that's going to fall. Tau minus one is increasing, so x is going to fall. You'll have a decrease in tightness. So uh, the reason why tightness decreases, so you have two parts to the argument. One is because beta over one minus beta is going to drop. And second is because to the matching wage is a strictly increasing function. So to minus one, its inverse is also increasing. Okay, uh, so tightness is going to decrease. What's the reason for that? If sellers have more bargaining power, why would we have this? Well, to understand why, you just have to look at what happens to the price. Price P, price P is given here. Um, so if beta falls, if beta falls, one minus beta is going to go up. Epsilon minus one, that's positive. So this thing here is going to increase. Uh, Tau minus one, beta over one minus beta, that's a tightness. We said that that's going to fall. F of this, therefore, because F is an increasing function, that's going to fall. And of course, all of this is in the denominator. So one over that, that's going to increase. So basically, this whole thing here, that's going to increase. Okay. Uh, and that's not sure. That's, you know, what we would have expected, right? Because if sellers have more bargaining power, uh, we expect that the price uh, in all the transactions is going to be higher. Um, and the tightness, uh, the tightness is going to be uh, actually, uh, tightness is going to be lower. So the price P here oops, increases. So in a bargaining shock, unlike the aggregate demand and aggregate supply shocks that were uh, neutral in terms of tightness. Here, uh, this has an effect on tightness. Uh, so decreasing bargaining power will lead to a decrease in uh, tightness. The price P uh, is going to increase. And then because tightness falls, we can figure out what's going to happen. So here, tightness X decreases. So output uh, is going to decrease when uh, sellers have a higher bargaining power. The idleness, one minus f of x, that's going to increase. Measure productivity because people are more idle, that's going to decrease. The matching wage tau of x, that's going to decrease. So all the stuff, uh, all the usual stuff when tightness decreases. Output as usual, fluctuation in tightness. Uh, Consumption, we don't know exactly what happens because you have two opposing forces uh, with f of x falling, but also tau of x falling. So consumption may increase or decrease. Uh, here it's it's unclear at this stage. Uh, but so, and what's the intuition for this? 
Well, the idea is that um, if uh, servers have a higher bargaining power, which is here the experiment we are doing, it has to be therefore that um, buyers have a, get a lower surplus from their transaction. But the surplus that the buyer gets is commensurate to the matching wage because if the if the common bargaining exchange breaks down, you know uh, the sell, the buyer can always get the same good, but by re uh, experiences one bout of matching and doing another visit and meeting somebody, meeting another seller. So if the matching wedge is very big, it means that it's very costly to find uh, another uh, seller, which means that the buyer gets a big surplus from that current match, uh, you know, because uh, the cost of finding another seller is very high. So that means that, you're, you know, when you compare the current situation with your outside option, if the difference is very big, it means you're taking a big chunk of the surplus with you as a buyer. So when tightness is very high, uh, mechanically in this model, uh, buyers get a big chunk of the surplus out of it. And so here we're assuming that we're looking at what happens when sellers' bargaining power goes up, so they have to take a bigger chunk of the surplus with them. So the only thing that this all works out in the model is that your tightness has to fall so that the share of the surplus that buyers take away is smaller. So that's what happened. And, you know, because we're in a macro model, uh, you know, the logic is a bit more complicated. It's not just saying, well, the, the price of that individual transaction is going to change when bargaining power changes, because the problem is that when bargaining power changes, it changes in all transactions. And then we have to look through the micro effects at what has to happen to make sure that buyers get a smaller share of the surplus. And what has to happen is that you need to be in a lower tightness world. So these are the comparative statics. And as we can see, um, so we have a massive difference with uh, what happened uh, what happened with a fixed price. Uh, and so what are the big difference? So we have big difference between uh, bargain and fixed price. So one difference is that AD shocks are neutral in that they don't affect quantities under bargain price, but not, of course, a fixed price. Another key difference is that <coughs> As shocks do not affect tightness. Under bargained price, but they do under fixed price. That's a, another key difference. <coughs> Um, so, AD and AS shocks, and of course, you know, everything that goes along with it, uh, because we know that when tightness changes and everything, all the other quantities are going to move. But, so, that's the key difference. So, um, under a bargain price, you shouldn't see any movement in tightness, whether it's from demand shocks or supply shocks, uh, whereas you would see a lot of movements if you have a fixed price. And, you know, down the line, we look at empirical evidence to uh, argue that indeed it looks like prices are fixed or if not fixed rigid because we do see big fluctuation in tightness and you know slack uh, over the business cycle <clears throat>